Welcome to this American College Health Association webinar on FERPA and HIPAA privacy awareness. I am Michael Huey from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am the 2017-18 ACHA president. In this course, we're going to talk about FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. These are two pieces of federal legislation that per pertain to privacy and the protection of healthcare records and protected health information for our college students and our university campuses. We're gonna look at the similarities and differences between HIPAA and FERPA. We'll learn about FERPA educational and treatment records. We'll learn about situations under which both FERPA and HIPAA may apply, or only one of them may apply. We'll also talk about the treatment payment and healthcare operations and the minimum necessary rule that govern our use of protected health information. We'll finish up the course by answering common questions about FERPA and HIPAA privacy. Our learning objectives will be to define FERPA and HIPAA and their applicability in our college and university health and counseling services, to compare the FERPA and HIPAA standards and how they contrast, to look at FERPA education versus treatment records, to explain the definition of protected health information and its uses and disclosures, and then to look at common FERPA and HIPAA compliance questions. So let's start by looking at FERPA and HIPAA at our colleges and universities. As a college and university health and wellness professional, we have an ethical and legal obligation to protect the privacy of our students, patients, and clients, including their healthcare records. And this is an obligation that we all take very seriously on our college and university campuses. As with all legal situations, and I will be saying this frequently throughout the webinar, it is very important to consult with your college or university general counsel or your college or university attorney regarding the approach on your individual campus to FERPA, HIPAA, and privacy. Your general counsel's instructions should supersede any information that's provided in this webinar. There also may be situations under which statutes and regula regulations in your state may supersede the FERPA and HIPAA guidelines because FERPA and HIPAA are privacy minimums, not privacy maximums. We also have an obligation to train our employees, particularly those that will be directly handling healthcare information about the policies and procedures that are used to protect that information under FERPA and HIPAA. We need to design that training to fit our own college and university, and that will be a training that will allow each of the employees to carry out their own day-to-day -day activities within your healthcare setting. So what is HIPAA and what is FERPA? FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Both of these are pieces of federal privacy legislation that have a direct impact upon our handling of information in our educational and treatment records on our campuses. So these two privacy rules are federal laws. HIT FERPA is a law that protects the privacy of students, education records, and treatment records on our campus. And in most of our college health settings, FERPA applies to the care provided to students at our student health and counseling services. The HIPAA privacy rule 
was created to provide national standards to protect personal health information of individuals, or PHI, and to give those individuals increased access to their own healthcare records. In most college and healthcare settings, HIPAA will apply to the care provided to non-students, such as dependents or faculty or staff or visitors that are seen at your student health services. There may be settings though, including perhaps the setting on your campus, where centers are completely under the umbrella of a university health system or a school of medicine, or where those centers may be performing uh, under a contract with an outsourced health center. And in those sorts of settings, HIPAA may apply to the care provided to all patients or clients. So once again, it's very important in your setting to consult with your general counsel if you believe that HIPAA applies to all or part of the care that is provided in your health and counseling centers. So why FERPA and not HIPAA for students? In 2013, the, the revisions to the HIPAA regulation and the Department of Education and Health and Human Services guidance documents made it clear that HIPAA does not apply to college and university education records or the subset of treatment records on our colleges and universities. This has actually been true for several years, but the regulations had not yet been operationalized, and therefore it wasn't entirely clear on our campuses whether we were supposed to be following HIPAA or FERPA. FERPA applies to colleges and universities that receive funds that are administered by the U.S. Department of Education. So frankly, that is likely to apply to every campus that is listening to this webinar because most of us are receiving funding by the U.S. Department of Education. Under FERPA, there is a difference between education records and treatment records. So we're going to look at that now. What's an education record? Well, under FERPA, an education record is a record that is directly related to a student and is maintained by an educational agency or institution or by a party acting for that agency or institution. Under FERPA, there is the requirement of a written consent from an eligible student, so a student who has reached the age of majority, which is 18 years in most of our states, and is attending a post-secondary institution, or consent from parents for a student that is not yet um, a student who has reached the age of majority or is still a minor, in order to release personally identifiable information, or PII, from educational records. FERPA also provides ways in which a school may share information from an eligible student's education record with parents without the student's consent, although the university is not necessarily required to share that information. So under FERPA, students have a right to review their education record. There are limits on how those records can be used without the written consent from the student. Like health records in most of our settings, education records can be disclosed without a written consent in connection with a court proceeding with a legal subpoena or in connection with health and safety emergencies. However, education records can be disclosed without a student's consent to parents who claim that student as a dependent on their taxes. Fortunately, for most of us, uh, we will agree that it is good that treatment records cannot be shared just because a parent is claiming a student as a dependent upon taxes. So then what are treatment records? Treatment records under FERPA 
are excluded from these definitions of education records that we just reviewed. And treatment records are records that are made by a physician, psychiatrist, psychologist, or a recognized professional or paraprofessional that are made, maintained, and used only in connection with treatment and that are either not shared or are shared only with other treatment providers. So your student health and counseling records, unless you are in certain categories of healthcare and counseling centers, as we described earlier, would be considered treatment records under FERPA. The good news is that treatment records under FERPA are handled in most ways like protected health information under HIPAA. However, there are some ways in which they differ. Under FERPA, treatment records by definition are not available to anyone other than the professionals providing treatment to the student or to physician, counselors, or other appropriate professionals of the student's choice, essentially through a release of information. So can a treatment record ever change into an education record. This is really not any different than the situation that we have had under HIPAA. If you take a treatment record and then you disclose it outside of the treatment arena, for example, you send a letter of accommodation to your Office of Undergraduate Education for a student. Once that letter becomes part of the files, in the Office of Undergraduate Education, that letter is now an education record in their system and no longer a treatment record. Well, again, that was true under HIPAA as well. If we sent such a letter to the Office of Undergraduate Education or to Disability Services, once that healthcare information has left the healthcare arena and belongs to someone outside of the healthcare arena, it has always not been protected by HIPAA in their hands. They are not healthcare providers. In 2016, the US Department of Education created a Dear Colleague letter when a number of concerns arose about FERPA covering treatment records on our college and university campuses and whether or not that was opening up those records to inappropriate access. And I'm just gonna quote three areas from that dear colleague letter. The first, to provide a clarifying example, if an institution providing counseling services to a student and the student subsequently sued that counseling center's institution, claiming that the services themselves were inadequate, the school's attorneys should be able to access the student's treatment records without obtaining a court order or consent. So under these circumstances, if your attorneys are defending you in a malpractice suit, then they are your attorneys and they have access to the records to help you prepare for that malpractice suit. Let's go back to another quote then from the Dear Colleague letter. However, if instead the litigation between the institution and the student concerned the student's el eligibility to graduate and therefore not the treatment that the student received, the school should not access the student's treatment records without first obtaining a court order or consent. And under no circumstances should an institution seek to access such records in an effort to intimidate or otherwise retaliate against a student for reporting or litigating claims of discrimination, including but not limited to sexual harassment and assault. What are some other important differences between HIPAA and FERPA? Well, FERPA does not have a clause in it that specifically allows disclosure for public health activities. Therefore, either the student would receive a notice in many of our settings saying that we are going to follow 
the state and federal rules for disease surveillance or FDA reporting, or the school may say that FERPA is a minimum set of restrictions and that the state and federal guidelines supersede FERPA in terms of reporting and disclosure for public health activities. FERPA does not specifically allow for disclosure of reporting abuse to a relevant authority. So many schools in their overall consent for treatment and their privacy consent under FERPA will say, we are going to follow mandatory reporting to state officials of child abuse or elder abuse. Once again, FERPA is a minimum and your state may supersede those guidelines even without you giving a notice to the student. Therefore, many of our sites will add specific information about these required disclosures so that it can be said, yes, we told you that we were going to follow state and federal laws in terms of releasing your protected health information from your treatment records. However, it doesn't need to be done one student at a time. It can be part of the overall consent and treatment forms that you use on your campus. Once again, as I've stated on earlier slides, check with your general counsel if you are unsure. So a quick summary. HIPAA does not apply to student medical and counseling records at most of our colleges and universities, FERPA does. Treatment records under FERPA are handled in most ways like protected health information under HIPAA, but not in all ways. The student does not have a right under FERPA to inspect and review unshared treatment records, but the student does have a FERPA right to inspect and review treatment records that have been shared outside the healthcare arena and have become educational records on your campus. Ask your college or university general counsel for guidance on your campus and in your state about the specifics of where HIPAA applies and where FERPA applies on your campus. Let's talk about protected health information. What is protected information? Well, under FERPA, it's called Personally Identifiable Information, or PII, and under HIPAA, it's called Protected Health Information, or PHI. And this protected information is any information that identifies the past, present, or future physical or mental health of an individual. And very importantly, protected information includes all communication, written, verbal, or electronic. And these policies extend to all individually identified health information in the hands of covered entities. And those covered entities include healthcare providers and administrative staff in those healthcare settings. Well, there are many, many identifiers of personal identifiable information and personal health information. And I won't read over this lengthy list, and there are some unusual ones, including things like the vehicle identification number on your car, which can be connected to you through Department of Motor Vehicle Records and therefore identify you. So probably the important thing to say is that any identifying information that could reasonably identify that patient or client should be protected. It's important to think about verbal communications, and yes, we are going to talk about our patients with colleagues so that we can put together the best available health care and counseling care for our students patients and clients. But we need to be careful when we are in any sort of public area or when we are in an area 
where students have routine access in our health and counseling areas. That can include places like elevators or hallways in our health and counseling services or the waiting rooms of our health and counseling services or in a cafeteria or in public areas on campus or in our hospitals or other areas of the university. As we talked about earlier, state law supersedes HIPAA and FERPA if those state laws are more restrictive. So once again, FERPA and HIPAA are minimum privacy standards that we must meet in our healthcare organization. But if a state law is more restrictive on a subject that FERPA and or HIPAA cover, you must meet the privacy standards of your state. This really occurs most commonly in our settings with our mental health and counseling records, where there is a higher level of privacy under most state laws. Check with your general counsel if you are unsure about instances under which state law would supersede FERPA or HIPAA on your campus. Now let's look at the use and disclosure of this protected health information. When we're talking about use and disclosure of protected health information under HIPAA, and this is also very good guidelines to keep in mind in terms of FERPA in our settings, protected health information should be used only for TPO and TPO is treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Now, it's important to point out that when we're talking about treatment, we're not talking about just prescriptions or surgeries or the things that we might write down in our electronic or paper records. Treatment is all of the healthcare that is provided to a student, patient, or client in our setting. Now, what's the minimum necessary rule? The minimum necessary rule is a good guideline to follow under HIPAA and FERPA settings because under that rule, the disclosure of health information, protected health information, even when that disclosure is authorized by the regulations, should be limited to the minimum necessary to accomplish the purpose for which that disclosure was made. So for example, if I am a primary care physician in a student health center and I am releasing information about a complicated tonsillitis that I am sending with my patient to see the ear, nose, and throat specialist at our university health center. Well, when I'm sending that information, yes, it is for treatment, so it can be disclosed. But under the minimum necessary rule, I'm only going to send information about that student's tonsillar problem and problems with infections in the throat. There would be no reason to send counseling information. There would be no reason to send copies of a women's annual exam. We want to send just the minimum necessary information to accomplish the purpose for which we are doing this disclosure. What about incidental use and disclosures? Under FERPA, there are no penalties for incidental or unintentional disclosure of personally identifiable information. And under FERPA, patients or clients do not need to be notified of an incidental or unintentional disclosure. I will tell you that in probably most, and maybe even hopefully all, of our student health and counseling centers, we do notify our patients of unintentional disclosure of their health records because it's the right thing to do and it's the ethical thing to do. HIPAA also acknowledges that incidental disclosures may occur, but those disclosures are not considered to be a HIPAA violation. Once again, under HIPAA, Generally, we are going to notify our students, patients, or clients 
of an incidental or unintentional disclosure. We have to take reasonable safeguards with our students, protected health information, and protected personally identifiable, identifiable information. But we only disclose, once again, the minimum necessary information. There is also important things to talk about under inappropriately accessing protected information. We should only, as healthcare employees, whether we are healthcare providers or administrative employees, we should only access protected information in order to perform our job duties and to perform functions on behalf of that patient or client or on behalf of the healthcare organization and operations of that healthcare organization, once again, including payment or operations. Most healthcare systems have methods by which they electronically monitor the use of their healthcare records. And so it can be seen by audit who looked at what records and when. Generally, it's against policy in most of our settings to access your own healthcare records that were created for you as a patient. You need to go through your medical records department or through your clinical provider to access those records. You also should not access records at the request of a friend or a coworker if you are not directly involved in the care provided to that individual. So let me give you an example. A coworker comes to you and she says, I see Dr. Jones at the University Health Center, but she is really bad at getting back to me with my results. And I have an MRI that I had done last week and I don't have that information back. Could you go in to the university health system and find that MRI report and give me a copy of it? And the answer to that is no, unless you are directly involved as a provider for that coworker. I will tell you that at many of our colleges and universities, accessing records for a friend or coworker, if you are not directly involved in the care, or accessing the records of a celebrity or um, perhaps a high profile student athlete on your campus, if you are not directly involved in the care, could get you fired. When we're giving any sort of protected information to someone outside of our own healthcare record system, we have an obligation to verify the identity and the authority of that person to have access to those records. So that will include patients and clients, personal representatives of those patients or clients, including family members and parents, law enforcement, individuals doing research on healthcare records, or public officials. We must verify the identity and we must be sure that that person, in fact, has been granted the authority to have access to those records before we release. What about the HIPAA security rule? So we've been talking about the HIPAA privacy rule, which deals with protected health information. But the HIPAA security rule is actually dealing with the electronic systems that create protected health information and store that he protected health information, or EPHI. And therefore, the HIPAA security rule is a subset of what the HIPAA privacy rule encompasses. It establishes a national set of standards to protect individuals' electronic personal health information that has been created, received, used, or maintained by a covered entity. And all of us must abide by the HIPAA security rules, whether our health center 
is governed by FERPA or HIPAA or both, we have to abide by the security rule. There is a link on your screen that will take you to the Health and Human Services site that will go over issues related to the security rule and give guidance to healthcare professionals on how they must follow those rules. So, what about then your over, overall approach to FERPA or HIPAA? Maybe you have been a health center that has been covered by HIPAA, as we all were, until transitions were made in federal guidelines, and now our university attorneys are telling us that we are covered by FERPA. Well, here's your overall approach. You probably don't need to markedly change what you are doing. You need to continue to treat all patient and client information with respect for the privacy of that patient or client. If you have any doubt about whether or not you should be disclosing information under HIPAA, FERPA, or both of certain subsets of information, seek the advice from your college or university general counsel. Well, let's close out today by looking at some common compliance questions under HIPAA and FERPA. Our first question is, if a student is a patient at our student health clinic and they ask for copies of lab results, EKGs, radiology reports, or other parts of that student medical record, can we give those records to the patient. And the answer is yes. Under both FERPA and HIPAA, patients are allowed to have access to their own health records upon request. Our second question, can we leave text messages or messages on a patient or client's voicemail or answering machine? And the answer is yes, but. Text messaging is not a secure, confidential way to communicate. So many schools take the step of getting specific permission to text information to their students, or they have it be a part of their standard consent form that a student can opt out of. But even if you have done that, you need to follow the minimum necessary information rule and you need to meet the, your obligation to verify that this is, in fact, the text or phone number or answering machine, if your students actually ever set up their answering machines, of that specific patient or client. And until you have done that, you cannot release protected information. Our third question. Can we call a patient or client by name in the waiting area? And the answer is yes. If you call a patient by name in the waiting room, that is part of healthcare operations, which is part of TPO. So, we yes, we do have an obligation to verify the identity before we release protected healthcare information. So if we call a client or student by name in our waiting room, we need to be sure if we've used just a first name that we have the correct patient or client. And if we've used both names, once again, we need to be sure that the correct person has responded before we do anything that would release protected information for that person who is there to be seen. Question number four, what if I want to send flowers to a patient or client's home? And well, maybe you might want to do that because a student has been very sick and they are now home from the hospital and let's send flowers to show that patient or client how much 
we care about them. Can I look up that patient or client's address in our health record so that I can get those flowers to them? And the answer is no. You can only access a patient or client's healthcare records for TPO, treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. And yes, flowers are lovely, but they do not qualify. Number five, is it okay to talk to a patient or client on a speaker phone? Yes, but you have an obligation, once again, to identify that you are speaking to the right person before you release any information via speakerphone or any other method by which a student, patient, or client may get that information. We also have an obligation to do our best to ensure auditory privacy. On your end, that means that you can't be talking on a speakerphone right out in the middle of your clinic or your counseling center. And if possible, you wanna be sure that there is privacy on both ends of the call, but absolutely, you need to be sure that it's private on your end if you're going to use the speakerphone. Number six, can we fax or email PII or PHI to someone? Well, this is another yes, but answer. For a fax, we have an obligation to verify the identity of who we are faxing to and that we have the correct fax number before we release any information. Email is not a secure communication system. Now, in some of our campuses, there may be security if you are inside a secure university firewall, but you would want to be sure that this applies on your campus. So many of our health centers and our counseling centers, instead of sending email, use their electronic health record and the patient portal and secure messaging part of their electronic health record to communicate with their students rather than using email because it is much, much more secure. Number seven, is it permissible to share patient or client information with the campus behavioral intervention team? And under what circumstances can you do so? And many of us have these teams now on our campus to help protect the safety of both the individual student and of others and the campus itself but is it permissible with us to share that information with that team? Well, gave you a little extra time on that one because it is a tricky question. Uh, there may be circumstances under which you can share information, but it's gonna depend upon the makeup of that team and the role that the behavioral intervention team has on your campus. So you may be able to share information on some campuses in a situation where a student is a danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. But it is very important to establish the guidelines of how you are gonna use your behavioral intervention team and how you are going to share information, if at all, with members of that team. And talking to your university general counsel or your university or college attorney is critical in this very, very tricky area of sharing information on our campuses. So let's look at some final tips about HIPAA and FERPA. Well, what can we do to ensure the privacy of our patients and clients at our college or university? Well, first of all, 
make sure that you're following the privacy policies of your campus and do not access patient or client information unless it is for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, or TPO. Make sure that if you have patient or client information that is no longer needed and it is on paper, be sure that it is destroyed either through shredding or by placing it in a locked collection box that is then taken to a certified private shredding company. And get paper shredders to be used throughout your areas so that pieces of information on paper that would identify your patient or client and is protected, that, that those pieces of paper are appropriately destroyed. Conduct a, conduct a walkthrough in your area to identify where you may have privacy or security concerns. And, and having more than one person on this walkthrough, or maybe even having one of your campus privacy officers come with you to take a look Make sure that, for example, your computer screens are not visible to people outside of your work area or people that might come and stand behind you when you are working on protected health information. When you get up from your desk or leave the exam room, make sure to securely store any patient or client information that's on paper and to log off your computer to prevent unauthorized access to your patient's protected information and frankly, to the protected information of any other student, patient, or client that is stored in that computer system. Don't provide anybody with your computer login or user ID or password. Remember that the information in your electronic health records is protected and that whoever is using your user ID to look in that record is using it as if they were you. Don't talk about patients or clients in public areas, and we've talked about such spaces as elevators, buses, cafeterias, restaurants, hallways. Take the extra precautions to be sure that you are in as private an area as you can be. Also take extra privacy precautions if your work area is accessible to the public. If you're transporting patient or client information, and specifically this would be referring to paper information, make sure that identifiable information is not showing while you are transporting that information. And at the end of the day, make sure that you properly shut down your computer and that you have locked all cabinets or rooms that contain patient, student, or client protected information. So we're gonna close with the same comment that we opened with. Colleges and universities and all of us who work there have an ethical and legal obligation to protect the privacy of our students, patients, and clients. And including, and I would say most importantly, their health care and counseling records. If you want more information on FERPA or HIPAA or the circumstances under which they may apply on your campus, go to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Education joint guidance on the application of Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, and how they apply to student records. And on your screen is a link to that Department of Education document. Also, if you want more information about the HIPAA security rule and its um, obligations that you have for the protection of electronic health information, there's a link on your screen for that as well. Thank you for joining this webinar. I hope that it has proved beneficial to you and that this material presented by the American College Health Association actually answers more questions than it creates for you. This is a difficult area 
on many of our campuses, but remember what we are trying to do is to take all steps that we can to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of health and counseling information of our students, patients, and clients. Thank you for joining this webinar.